We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. We can begin. So thank you everybody for this, I think, very timely discussion on the, the past, present, and future of the UN Cyber Dialogues. Um, um, I'm very delighted to have a uh, distinguished pa panel um, from across the world uh, joining us uh, earlier today, uh, today rather. Um, and uh, the what we're trying, what we're going to try and do is to have a um, sort of a level setting to begin with in terms of um, where we are in the discussions on cybersecurity at the UN. Um, there are several initiatives uh, going on, um, figuring out, talking and figuring out a little bit about how far we have come, uh, particularly over the past couple of years, because there's been um, some significant progress. And then also look to the future um, in terms of the new open-ended working group starting up next week, but also um, potential other avenues and dialogues that are touching on cybersecurity and are taking place in the different international um, forums and arenas, not just the UN. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about um, you know, as this is largely a state-to-state -state discussion, um, how the multi-stakeholder community, so the community of industry, civil society, academia, um, and others can most effectively engage um, in this process and in, in, with the governments themselves. Um, and um, throughout this, we'll try to um, answer as many questions as you might um, have. So please, you know, I have a very long list of questions, but um, also um, if you have a question to pose to any of our panelists, but also, you know, comment or suggestion, uh, please either raise your hand and um, we'll call on you or put it in the chat um, and I can read it out and direct it. Um, as you do that, do introduce yourself so uh, we know where the question is coming from, uh, whether you're in your individual capacity or representing a particular group. Um, and with that, um, I will start uh, with actually properly introducing the panel. We have today, and I will do it very quickly and hope that uh, each of the panelists as they start with their opening remarks can say a little bit more about themselves as well as sort of the path that has gotten us that has gotten them to this uh, to the cybersecurity and diplomacy arena. I think uh, we all have very different ways of getting there. So I think it's 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 interesting to sort of consider the perspectives as well. Um, so <laughs> we have uh, Mr. Isaac Morales, coordinator for multidimensional security, multilateral affairs, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Mexico. We have we have Henri Verdier, the Tech Ambassador, um, Ministry of Europe and Foreign Affairs of France. Giacomo Persi Paolo, Program Lead, Science and Technology at Unidir. Pablo Castro, Cybersecurity Coordinator, Ministry of Foreign Affairs Chile. And Natalie Yarsma, which I really hope I'm pronouncing correctly, <laughs> Ambassador for Security Policy and Cyber from the Netherlands. Um, as I mentioned, uh, this group will touch upon first uh, some of the things that have gone before. Um, so with that, I want to uh, give the floor to the first panelist I introduce. Um, uh, Isaac, do you want to talk a little bit about the priorities of Mexico in this space, um, as well as, like I said, a little bit about you in your quick opening statement? Thank you very much, uh, Kaya. Um, first of all, just let me thank uh, all, all of you, all my dear colleagues, uh, to, to join this conversation, uh, which is, by the way, a very um, timely conversation as we will face next week uh, the, the substantive session, the first substantive session of the open-ended working group. 
and uh, and and also a plural in a plural setting the scene, uh, having with us uh, you uh, from 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 different uh, um, uh, governments, regions, and stakeholders, which is by the way uh, one of the core values uh, that we uh, all together need to preserve in the in the in the future uh, discussions of the UN. Um, just let me um, uh, um, share uh, in general um, from, from our point of view, from the point of view of the government of Mexico, um, that the, 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 the first element we do need to emphasize is the importance of having this kind of conversations and dialogues on cyber and the different uh, uh, elements regarding cybersecurity, cyberspace governance, uh, applicability of international law, etc., in multilateral settings. This is perhaps the very first message to keep uh, 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 very clear that the multilateral fora, the multilateral settings, the, the UN role, of course, but not only within the UN, but beyond and re at the regional level, but the multilateral uh, uh, scenario is the best way to address this very uh, core uh, um, um, elements and, uh, uh, and, and, and challenges regarding cyber in general. The second element uh, I, I will say also um, that it's perhaps the idea of peaceful uses, the idea of lawful uses, and the idea to preserve a balance between the development concerns, I mean, all that you can do with these technologies and platforms and cyberspace to advance development. They need to protect the rights in that space, in that platforms, in cyberspace in general. And of course, the concerns on security will be, in general, the, the way to advance better and the way to advance in a more comprehensive way, all these kind of efforts. And I do believe sincerely uh, after following and participating in both the GGE recent process and the open-ended working group, the last open-ended working group, that we now have a framework, a general framework uh, that could uh, um, take into account as basis for the next steps at the multilateral discussions and, and, and to all uh, multilateral settings. In this regard, um, my very first also uh, um, invitation to all of us when thinking on next steps at the UN level and multilateral uh, uh, level discussions on cyber will be implementation, the call to implementation. Now we do have very, very important uh, framework, which includes uh, some norms for responsible state behavior, uh, which includes CBMs, confidence building measures, which includes also some uh, approximation to trends and challenges. And of course, taking uh, as a departing point, the reaffirmation of applicability of international law to cyberspace. All of this link to capacity building and the better ways to address the needs and obstacles to advance cybersecurity and cyberspace governance because of lack of capacity or um, because of the uh, uh, current and existing um, digital gaps. So when you take into account all these elements and coming in, in very close uh, uh, detail from the GGE reports, the group of governmental experts of the UN and the recent open-ended working group also uh, um, uh, having both uh, um, consensus reports, by the way, uh, you will see this very whole picture that we, where we are approaching at the multilateral level and concretely at the UN level to all these discussions. Um, 
just uh, I, I will I will I will of course uh, let my colleagues to deep uh, to go further and in more detail on some of these elements uh, that we are advancing at, at multilateral setting. But just also to to reaffirm that for the coming for the coming actually days, but for the coming uh, negotiations and discussions, uh, we do need, from my point of view, to preserve this comprehensiveness, the idea of implement or to advance on what we already have, and of course, keeping the core value of the multi-stakeholder view. Uh, most of these processes have been states processes, but with the substantive uh, contributions, participations, and inputs coming from the multi-stakeholder community. We do need to preserve this core value to the, to the future discussions at the UN level, of course, but also at the regional level where we, for instance, in the Americans are uh, having uh, more advance uh, advancements on uh, perhaps CBMs uh, through the o uh, OAS and a working group on CBMs concretely at, at this stage. I would let right here, uh, Kaya, in order we perhaps to, to come back and, and to, dip, uh, in, to go into details in some elements. Thank you. Ah, for sure. I feel that I have a bunch of questions just uh, um, listening to your first round of remarks. Um, the next person that I introduced was uh, Henri. So perhaps, uh, Henri, I think maybe if you could talk a little bit about, um, again, yourself, your background, um, and France has, has been particularly active in this space um, over the past few years, not just at the UN, but there as well with the program of action um, uh, proposals as well. And then also, of course, through the Paris call. So I would love uh, for you to, to talk a little bit as well about uh, why the, why the such, a, why does France consider, the, and you personally consider this a area of such a importance? Thank you very much. So yes, uh, my background briefly, uh, I'm Henri Verdier, French ambassador for digital affairs. But I am more a tech guy. I started my first company in 1995. And in between, I was uh, the state CTO for France. I did lead the open data policy, but also uh, a wide government as a platform approach with uh, friends like the UK government digital service or the White House CTO. And now I'm in charge of um, digital affairs in the MFA. And maybe, yes, with this background, uh, I am more sensitive about the, the infrastructure itself, because I, I consider that um, if we want to build uh, trust on safety, yes, and I'm very clear here, we need norms, we need good behavior, or we need international engagement, and why not consequence imposition to those who don't respect those engagements, but we need also uh, a safe IT, uh, a culture of security by design in the companies, a culture of uh, responsible divulgation of uh, uh, the, the responsible disclosure of, uh, of failure uh, from the research. We need to build knowledge on data and to work together. And that's why we, we try to promote a lot uh, Real, real multi-stakeholder approach of those issues. So first, we did welcome, uh, of course, the fact that uh, the UN processes did try to open a bit to the civil society, and we had first good results. But from our perspective, that's not enough. So that's a good first step, but that's not enough. So uh, three years ago, the president, Macron, did launch the Paris Call for Trust and Safety in the Cyberspace which is now a great multi-stakeholder platform. We did welcome two weeks ago uh, the support of the US and the EU. So that's what's great news. Um, now we are with the US 80 states, but also more than 700 companies from every continent and more than 350 civil society organization 
And we work together, and we work together on very important issues. Um, so we had a six working group, uh, for example, how to best uh, help, uh, to better help uh, emerging countries, uh, how to, to build a cyberspace stability index, because we need to know and to understand uh, uh, the level of security of, or the level of threat in the cyberspace. Etc. So, and one of these group was about uh, how to, to to better engage a strong multi-stakeholder approach in the UN negotiations. So, I'm very happy to share with you the link of the, this uh, document because that's a very interesting uh, report, and, it's, and I suggest uh, sincerely to, to read it. <coughs> so now we have this platform. The, the, P, the, the Paris call is just. Um, a forum to work together on exchange. But taken into account the conclusion of the, the Paris call, we are proposing, we, we, with a lot of friends, because now we are 54 countries, we are proposing to the United Nations to establish a permanent dedicated organization, a program of action. Uh, working on these issues. So financing, capacity building, for states that need this, that say they need this. Publishing uh, this kind of index, organizing the sharing of data, and of course, discussing about how to implement the norms, the important norms that we did agree in the GG, past GGEs and actual past and next uh, open end working group. And with this format, with a program of action, we consider that we could build a better uh, bridge with civil society organization. We could imagine to have permanent observators. We could imagine to create working group, uh, but uh, yes, balance working group on very important issues. We could accept within the POA some suggestion coming from the civil society. We'll take one year to build this together within states and with the civil society. And we will propose something to the next UNGA uh, next year. But we consider that that's a good path and it was to, to try to, to build this new uh, vehicle within the United Nations. That is super helpful and a good overview of, in reality, all the efforts that France has, France and partners have been uh, driving to, to make multi-stakeholderism are a real thing in cyberspace um, as in particular. I've been reminded that I didn't introduce myself. So I'm Kaya, hi. Um, I am a senior director at Microsoft uh, leading our digital diplomacy team. So the team are working on this type of issues. Um, but um, also I want to turn to our uh, next guest, which is Giacomo. Um, who um, is not representing the government, but is representing Unidir in this space. And, and, and uh, Unidir takes, looks at, I think, a really broad uh, view of sort of UN and cyber dialogues, looking both at what's going on in cyber crime, what's going on at laws, potentially what's going to be going on on space and cyber. Uh, so it'd be great to hear a little bit about you, Giacomo, as well as the role your organization plays in this area. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Kaya, for the, for the introduction. And it's, a, it's an honor, a pleasure, and also a very humbling experience to be sharing the, the panel with uh, such excellent speakers. Um, so uh, about me, I'm, I'm, I'm Giacomo. I'm the program lead for security and technology at the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research. And indeed, uh, our portfolio is, is quite broad and covers uh, pretty much a, a very wide range of uh, new and emerging technologies and their implications for uh, international security. Cyber is uh, one of the main pillars of, of our work. And uh, I think in, in the specific context of the, uh, of the UN processes and the sort of uh, uh, role that we play in, in, in that context, um, I think it is important, first of all, to clarify what UNIDIR is. So UNIDIR, uh, despite having you know, UN and being in the name and being part of the broader UN family and UN system uh, is an independent research organization. It's a think tank, an independent think tank within the UN 
um, with a very broad mandate to uh, uh, conduct studies, research, forecasting, and, and foresight uh, to basically uh, contribute to the achievement of a more peaceful uh, uh, world. So within this very broad mandate, uh, we, we do set our own research agenda, and we are basically in a very privileged position of having one foot in the UN, but also one foot out. And this allows us to play the first important role that I wanted to highlight today, uh, which is uh, the role of the bridge builders. So the bringing together uh, communities in putting together states with industry, with uh, civil society. Uh, we had uh, an event a year ago, I think it was the, I remember it because it was the last event before the pandemic basically changed completely our ways of working. Um, and it was on, on uh, responsible vulnerability disclosure and we brought hackers in the room uh, as well. So it's really, um, a privileged position to to have to be able to convene under the the UN uh, flag such a diverse range of of uh, stakeholders in the spirit of our academic role and academic freedom and this of course uh, plays and feeds into the, the second role that I wanted to highlight which is the the role of um, uh, knowledge providers knowledge builders um, of course, we you know uh, we exist to support the informed participation of all member states to uh, the various uh, international security and disarmament processes, and we try to channel not only our own uh, uh, the knowledge that we acquire with our own research, but also the wealth of knowledge that exists outside of the institute through our work, through our convening power, and building knowledge has always been important in, in the cyber domain, but it's becoming particularly more important in the context of the UN processes, the moment that uh, these processes uh, with the first open-ended working group became open to all member states. That's where you see, you saw really um, uh, knowledge asymmetry playing an important role in the, the, the way and the, and the extent to which uh, different countries were able to engage. So, we see ourselves as a, a, a trying to level the playing field when it comes to uh, the knowledge base. And uh, last but not least, um, an important role that uh, Unidir has been playing over uh, over the course of the last uh, 10 to 15 years um, within the, the, the various uh, group of governmental experts that took place since 2004, um, we always had uh, a role uh, within the team that was supporting the chairperson of each of those processes to really help uh, make sure that the process would run would run smoothly. So three three very different but I think very important roles that that we play. Um, we're also very uh, excited of what the future will bring. Um, of course, a, a, a new open ended working group with a five year mandate is is. Uh, uh, a novelty with the first time that there is such a long time horizon. So we're really uh, excited to see uh, how we can support uh, that. You mentioned already the program of action. There is a, a lot, a lot that is uh, brewing in the in the cyber diplomacy field that we're really looking forward to see how we can um, how we can support. And of course, we're very proud. In addition to kind of the the knowledge that we're providing, we're also been developing over the years a set of tools that uh, member states or civil society or whoever is interested in, in cyber policy can use. And uh, allow me to, to do a shout out and shameless self-promotion of our cyber policy portal, which is a very successful uh, tool that has also been um, recognized as a confidence building uh, uh, tool within the, the two reports that uh, were agreed earlier this year. Lots of things to talk about, but I'll, but I'll pause for now and, and wait for the questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And I think the, the confidence building link is actually a really helpful link um, as I uh, turn to Pablo uh, to talk a little bit about um, what Chile has been doing and, um, and, and, you know, both at the UN on confidence building measures and more broadly. And of course, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you very much, Kaya, and uh, morning to everyone. Well, I'm, I'm the cybersecurity coordinator at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And, um, I used to be in charge of military affairs, NAMS control here in the ministry. So, um, but uh, maybe I have to say that my connection with cybersecurity or cyberspace has nothing to do maybe with the ministry. The reason why was because I, I am a very fan of science fiction. So uh, when I was a teen, I was uh, a 
uh, great fan of William Gibson, the cyberpunks writers during the 80s, the 90s. So that was my first connection, more cultural things than political one. But um, when I used to be in charge of military affairs, you know, cyber is going to be very important at the level of Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Forces. So um, we started at our ministry to work this issue into South 13, basically. And um, it was a very good coincidence because uh, at that moment, the government decides to work in our first national cybersecurity policy. And um, we other ministry, of, I mean, we, we other agencies, they understood very well about the, uh, the importance of the international engagement and the role of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So it was a kind of feedback, you know, we learned a lot from them. And they also understood pretty well about what we can do at the um, multilateral bilateral level. And CBMs, as you mentioned, Kaya, was one of the uh, first things I remember we worked with the Ministry of Defense um, in 2017. As you know, in our region, CBM has been very important since a long time. And um, I'm not speaking about cyber, but in general, I mean, CBMs are really, really important in, in our regions. We, we took as an example the uh, what was done in Europe since the beginnings of the 90s. So uh, I would say that uh, it was a natural step starting to work on CBM cyberspace. So in 2017, uh, we started a working group that exists until today. And uh, so far we have six CBMs. We are part of the, uh, or this, the work that is done by the working group. And four of them are actually related with cyber diplomacy. The reason for that is because we realized that in our region it was very important to work in the engagement of Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, in the cybersecurity and cyberspace you know, issues. And, um, and in some way it was a need because uh, in my case, every time I was to need to talk with someone else in Argentina, in Peru, in Colombia, um, there was no counterpart. So, I'm very glad that right now, after several years, it's right now quite easy, I mean, to find out a counterpart in, in those uh, in countries in our region. And also I would say that our, I mean, discussion and conversation at the end level also, I mean, was a good reason that state can, you know, specialize people and expert, put someone in charge. So it in some way is CBM in itself. Now, of course, I mean, this is something that ESAC mentioned very well. The main challenge in our region is implementation. You know, we're very good for the side, I mean, uh, for new things, but uh, the implementation, you know, is the uh, it's a thing that sometimes we uh, suffer some kind of lag in, in, in our regions. And that is connected, of course, with capacity building. Um, I, li I like to say that maybe capacity building is the most strategic subject. Uh, when it comes on discussion at the multilateral level, because allows to you, you know, to start other processes. We were mentioned this in our during our session on the uh, POA panel. I mean, on 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 Tuesday. Um, for example, when you if you want to move on 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 the um, national position about the implement the uh, application of international law, which is something that we definitely could do in in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. You need, I mean, to have expert for this. And the only way, I mean, to have this expert is thanks to training and capacity building. So far, it has been um, done by the OIS and, and SICTA and the cybersecurity program. Five years ago, as I remember, it was not possible for me to find a I mean, lawyer, you know, the Minister for Foreign Affairs who was connected or engaged with, the, with the cyberspace or cybersecurity. So, right now, I have, I mean, the uh, possibility to work with the kind of lawyers. So I think it's, it will be about time that the state can move on and in this particular issue. So um, I think it still is a lot thing to do. Um, I think um, in in the uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean, we can also, I mean, I think uh, can work more on implementation norms. Right now, the U.S. has the mandate, I mean, to help the state with doing so. Um, we have also, I mean, um, resolution regarding international law and its application cyberspace. So I think we had a very good moment in Latin America, I mean, to move on on, on this particular agenda. So um, I think, uh, I hope, I mean, the next year after this pandemic, we can actually uh, come together as the states 
and trying to in some way to share our experiences, to share our point of view on implementation of norms, CBMs, on the application of international law. That's going to be, I mean, my comments and feedback for myself. Thank you. Well, thank you. I think that was that was really helpful. And and you know, again, I feel there's lots of um, positive stuff in there, and so lots of questions that uh, I might have later on around. Uh, you know, how do you drive some of the implement implementation? And also, what were some of the things that were really positive um, and worked well in terms of, you know, bring, bringing more priority to this space? Um, and, you know, also from a capacity building perspective. And I think this is an area, I think, I think we all need to learn, you know, whether it's governments, irrespective of which ones, <laughs> um, uh, whether it's the private sector, whether it's the broader multi-stakeholder community. I think it's definitely an area that evolve, is evolving quickly. And I think there's a lot of white spaces that still need to be filled. And with that, I actually want to turn to Natalie as well, uh, last but not, not least, it's both in terms of Netherlands has been a lead uh, proponent of capacity building efforts, of course, uh, but also, um, we've had the pleasure of working together, not just on the UN processes, but also on uh, the, the Secretary General, General's roadmap on digital corporation, the trust pillar. Um, oh, and there's one of the questions about global compact there. So I think also wanted to see, and maybe later on in a little bit more detail, but as, as part of the introduction, you know, whether you wanted to touch upon some of those areas that are that go beyond just the open-ended working group and the GGE. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Kaya. And uh, um, it is a true pleasure to be um, on this panel with you and to contribute to this um, uh, thinking about the future of uh, cyber discussions in and, and beyond the UN. Um, just bear with me. Yeah, I want to see you all. Um, and um, my name is Natalie, Natalie Jarsma. I'm the ambassador at large for uh, security and uh, security affairs and cyber of the Netherlands. Um, I started this position uh, last year in September. Um, and I previously, before I joined the Foreign Service in 2001, worked uh, in the ICT uh, industry. Um, and just to look back and highlight a little bit the, uh, the things that the Netherlands has done in 2015, um, for us that was a, a real important year because our scientific uh, council for the government published a report with uh, advice about uh, the relevance of the public core and how our government should play a bigger role in protecting the public core through the multi-stakeholder model, obviously. In the same year, we hosted the Global Conference on Cybersecurity, uh, the Global Forum on uh, Cyber Expertise, so um, on, um, on capacity building was established. Um, the Global Commission on Cyber Stability, we were one of the initiators of that and, and the Global Commission, of course, has, great, has done great work on uh, norms development and is still doing uh, great work, I think. Um, and indeed, we have been very active in both the GGE and the open-ended uh, working group, um, but also on the um, uh, high level uh, panel process, uh, which later on was uh, changed into the, uh, uh, with another name and now we're in a transition again, I think, but what we're trying to drive here is the um, um, is a is a declaration on uh, security and trust, and I'm happy to talk about that uh, later. Uh, perhaps on um, uh, what what we have seen in the uh, in the discussions um, within the open ended working group, I uh, agree completely with what uh, Isaac said on uh, that the um, inclusiveness of the dialogue and the multilateral character that all states are uh, included is very, very important and we appreciate that. Um, but in addition to that, it is very important to listen to the expertise of other stakeholders groups and we really regret the opposition to the greater uh, participation of other stakeholders to this discussion. 
um, and we hope that we will find consensus on this issue uh, early next week. Um, and regarding the substance, like uh, Isaac also said, the starting point is really the current ACI, so the agreed normative framework, the reports of the GGEs and the open-ended working group. Um, and um, the, um, the, the priorities that we see uh, for ourselves is that in addition to the, to the norms that we have been advocating for in the previous open-ended working group, and we're happy to take that forward, for example, the public core norm, um, we also would like to see the open-ended working group to um, share their views on, like all states, on how they see the application of international law in cyberspace, because this um, would um, would create a better understanding among all. And this could hopefully also include further discussion on international human rights law and international humanitarian law. Um, and this is really, these two are very much a priority for us. Um, we also hope that the open-ended working group will develop a better understanding of the norms. Um, and there is avenue to dive deeper into a common understanding. Um, indeed, we started addressing some issues such as coordinated vulnerability disclosure in the previous round, but we lacked time to uh, discuss it uh, even, uh, even more. So those are just a few elements that I wanted to share already with you at this stage. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and it's and it's a it's great to hear um, that there is um, there that you know across the board uh, there is support for uh, greater multi stakeholder involvement in the in, in the processes. Would love to uh, pick you guys' ideas in terms of how that how that could be potentially done, but um, but also uh, from the the teams listening in. Um, as well, I think it would be very helpful to hear suggestions, I think, for all of our participants. The one thing I want to put, and I will ask John to maybe uh, post it, uh, the, the, chair, the chair of the Open Ended Working Group has a multi-stakeholder informal session organized next week. Um, and so, um, you know, please listen in um, and, and, and demonstrate um, your interest in this area. I think it's important that early on from a multi-stakeholder community, we signal that, um, it's that we think this is an important area. Um, but with this sort of set, the initial set of discussion, I will also, and looking also at some of the questions in the chat, I actually wanna turn um, to Giacomo um, to, um, we, you know, we talked a little bit about the things that have gone before and the successes, but it'd be great to hear a little bit about what were the processes so far and what, you know, we talked about the framework. Uh, what is the framework that we talked about? And then also just because, um, and like in the chat, there is a fair amount of things about the, the ad hoc committee um, on cybercrime to just also just see what is the difference um, between the processes and, and how are they separated. That would be helpful, I think. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm actually gonna, gonna start because it's uh, relatively quickly, at least to do so uh, in a couple of minutes to explain the difference between the two processes. Um, these are two processes, kind of the OAWG and the GGE, uh, International Peace and Security, those are processes that are established within the first committee of the General Assembly that deals with international security. The ad hoc committee is set up by another uh, uh, committee of the General Assembly, the third one, which is uh, normally where uh, issues related to, to, to crime are, are dealt with. So they are reporting to different uh, committees of the General Assembly. They, have they receive their mandate from different bodies with, and these bodies in themselves have very different mandates. So um, the way I, I, in general, I see the uh, international cybersecurity and, and cybercrime is a, a very uh, elementary school level Venn diagrams where you have the two circles and they're both kind of, a, uh, they're, they're clearly very distinctive features there you know international cybersecurity and cybercrime are not the same thing uh, they are 
they exist in their own merit, but they clearly share an area of overlap uh, in some aspects. Um, so maybe perhaps later on we can we can talk about about that. But that is just to just to clarify that there are there are two processes that are uh, uh, set up by different bodies of of the UN. So we're not again in a, in a condition where under the first committee we had two parallel processes that were the GG and the OEWG. Here they're very very distinct. But it is a you know your question was really about uh, um, uh, of course the, the 2021 reports are fresh in everybody's uh, memory and the fact that they were both successful and added a lot of substance to previously uh, uh, agreed um, uh, principles, languages, uh, uh, ideas, I think it's it's very important. Uh, but I think it's also equally important to reflect on, on the fact that uh, this has been a journey, uh, a journey that is uh, over 20 years old, uh, that started with a, a resolution in 1998 and had the first, uh, uh, you know, in, in the in the mid uh, uh, 2000, had uh, the first GG uh, that met, and there were five GGs before the last one, so six, so six in total. And in a way, every GG, uh, whether successful or not, has contributed to advancing debates, the negotiations. You could you could argue that having initially a group before it was open to every member state, but initially having a group of member states. Uh, sitting down and talking about these things, you know, had a value of its own. Uh, the ability to engage in diplomatic discussions on these issues, of course, it has matured significantly over time. And the framework that you're referring to is, you know, was not built in a day. And each, you know, each uh, uh, group in a way added a foundational stone to, to what now be becomes referred to as, as the framework, just to give you um, a few practical uh, examples. 2010, for example, was a very important year because it was the first time that uh, there was the recognition of states as a potential uh, uh, actor um, using uh, uh, ICT for malicious purposes. So something that today we take for granted, you know, it wasn't before, before then. Um, something in, so it was clearly a, a very important step because that recognition then triggered the discussion that then led to uh, the development of all the language around the importance of confidence building measures, the, impo the importance of cooperative measures among states. So really the, the, the emphasis on confidence building and, and, uh, and cooperative measures was triggered by the recognition of uh, the fact that states could indeed be uh, actors using ICTs for malicious purposes. And then in 2013, another very important milestone with the, the kind of the, the recognition that international law uh, applies to, to the cyberspace. So again, things that since then, uh, particularly those that have, have come to these debates without all the history are kind of taken for granted. They're the result of very uh, 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 long and some at times complex negotiations among states. Of course, after 2013, the the next one, 2015, is probably until the you know until the most recent processes. 2015 was was considered in a way almost from an international from a diploma cyber diplomacy perspective was almost like the, the golden age because it really produced or the golden year that produced. Um, both a very important uh, report for the GGE with the articulation of the 11 norms of responsible state behavior in cyberspace, in addition to reaffirming everything that was agreed until then. But it was also uh, the first time that the General Assembly uh, adopted by consensus a resolution that called for all member states, so not only those that were part of the GGE, but all member states to be guided in the use of ICTs by the uh, measures uh, and by the framework presented in that report. And that was a very significant milestone that was achieved. Uh, we know that after that, the, the following GGE did not reach uh, uh, consensus. So um, the way GGE are formed, you see the mandate that goes in. And if there is consensus, there is, you see the report that comes out. But otherwise, from outside, there isn't really uh, uh, visibility of what what are the discussions, but we know that no consensus was achieved, but yet it was still an important uh, 
uh, period of time that member states spent to discuss, articulate, and potentially to to kind of uh, uh, reinforce the things that they agreed on and further clarify what differences were. So I, I would like to think that the success of the 2019-2021 processes is rooted in both the successes and the failures of the, of the past. Um, so this is, you know, just to give a, a very short kind of historical account of, of how we got to, to where we are. Um, that's very helpful. And I think it would be, um, actually it would be interesting like that last point to maybe like pull a little bit on it. And, uh, you know, and I know it's not an easy question to ask, to answer because there's lots of, geopolitical and other issues at, at stake, but it would be great to understand a little bit more about why, you know, this past couple of years at the UN, there has been progress, there have been su successful reports, um, and, um, and why in 2015, the GDE was not able to, to get there. Um, you know, are there lessons learned in there from a state negotiation perspective that um, allow us to um, to take them into the open ended working group and move forward? I don't know. Maybe uh, Isaac, that's something I think you were in the last GGE. Maybe you can touch on what went really well, so that we now have a report. Thank you, Kaya, uh, for this question. And just let me um, uh, briefly introduce myself because I, 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 I realized that uh, in my first intervention, I was very passionate to, to, the, to the topics and very captured by your question and, and I didn't uh, pr introduce myself. Uh, I'm Isaac Morales. I'm uh, um, uh, head of multidimensional security uh, within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Mexico. And, and, and I emphasize this idea of multidimensional security because um, actually uh, we, we see not only cyber, but all related to uh, um, technology developments and challenges to security in, in this regard. And also those challenges for uh, uh, development link to uh, the, the, the new technologies and, and new threats and challenges. So, um, I have had the opportunity, having, having this, this uh, more uh, comprehensive uh, uh, view, have the opportunity to participate in, in, in the different processes, uh, which uh, we believe from Mexico um, has given us uh, a better understanding of what is happening, what, wh why and how and, and uh, are happening these discussions on cybersecurity, on cyberspace, on digital platforms, on digital technologies uh, at the same time. Um, so uh, it is key, it is a very fundamental question why, why and not only um, um, from the UN, but why we are um, able to advance uh, recently at the UN level uh, with both the open-ended working group and the GDE um, consensus reports and in comparison to previous efforts where, where, where simply was not possible to reach a consensus report. Um, I, I will say, uh, uh, Kaya and, and colleagues, that the more discussions we have, indeed the better. Of course, we face some challenges when uh, trying to accommodate uh, all these discussions um, uh, and uh, to advance priorities, to um, um, address concerns, etc. But looking at uh, how the international community, not only member states, but the whole international community are engaging more and more in the multilateral discussions on cyber, it is better for the fora, the formal fora it's, uh, themselves. Um, which, which I want to say is um, perhaps because we had simultaneous processes, uh, 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 an open-ended working group and a GG, the pressure coming one to other to reach something, to deliver something uh, was uh, uh, more than having only one uh, process because we expected to deal with some of our concerns, with some of our priorities in one track and simultaneously 
um, uh, uh, presenting the same uh, attitude and, and approaches to this other track. So perhaps the pressure, the continuous pressure, one to, uh, one to another, uh, will uh, in the end uh, help us to reach those consensus. Because at the same time, we were able to deal with some more detailed understandings to the GD channel, for instance, and more broader understandings and, and, and perhaps uh, initiatives, uh, for instance, uh, a call to, to reporting implementation through a survey, et cetera, on the open-ended working group side. Um, so um, this, this idea of having uh, multiple and simultaneous processes, of course, it is not the best scenario. The idea, the great idea will be having one track, one very big uh, uh, discussion on the whole things of cyber, but that is impossible. So we do need to understand that each of our uh, uh, mandates, each of our commissions, each, each of our fora has a, a concrete uh, added value to put in the, in the general track. Um, the, of course, uh, we, we faced uh, some uh, uh, geopolitical, of course, elements, etc., cetera, um, uh, to, to, to try to understand and to explain why we recently um, uh, had uh, uh, results and not before. Um, but beyond that, also, it is important um, uh, to emphasize two elements uh, from my point of view of the recent discussions, inclusivity and appropriation of the discussion. On the inclusivity si side, uh, my colleagues actually have developed uh, further um, because um, we have many people many experts, many more countries that in previous conversations. And the appropriation, it is great result of this inclusivity. Uh, at the very beginning of these processes, there was this idea that um, we were facing only a big players conversation, big players as member states or companies, but only big players. In the end, we, we now see how um, uh, it is not uh, related to, be, to, to have uh, uh, all the, 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 the potential, uh, but the interest to discuss and to contribute um, uh, from, from different member states, no matter what level of development, what level of capacity, and also from the multi-stakeholder community, no matter what the main focus, no matter what the capacity or the, or, 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 or the size of the companies or the organizations, et cetera. So I, 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 will, I will let right here, uh, taking then into account these two elements, the, the possibility to have simultaneously uh, coherence and complementarity for the processes, the, the, the value of inclusivity, and then the appropriation as, as some possible ways uh, to explain how uh, we face recent uh, uh, discussions and to reach um, uh, something to deliver. And I, I, I will let right here, uh, Kaya. That is, that is very helpful. And I think maybe I want to, you know, almost build on it and, and turn towards looking to the future. Um, and, you know, to, uh, we heard a little bit from you, Isaac, about you know, the priorities for Mexico, sorry, um, in terms of the, um, the in terms of the, uh, the, what you'd like to see in the new open-ended working group, uh, and particularly in terms of the implementation of the framework, um, both normative and international law, I think Natalie underlined uh, very similar objectives and highlighted as well the public core. Um, I wanted to see whether, um, Pablo or Henri, you have um, suggestions there as well in terms of what the priorities should be for the group. Because reflecting also some of the questions in the um, in the chat, I think there was one that talked all about questions talked asked. Um, you know whether uh, a potentially 
important thing would be to declare uh, cyberspace uh, an area of peace, uh, which I think would be lovely, but I think probably that boat has sailed. Uh, but uh, so I wanted to sort of see your comments on that. Who starts, Pablo? I can share a few views if you want. First, uh, I will start from Isaac's point. Uh, I totally agree that it's time for each of us to learn to see that we have to face various different questions and that we need dedicated fora for each question. You can understand, for example, that in the first committee, we speak about state behavior and we try to refrain some bad uh, actors. So it cannot be the same conversation as, for example, the future of a human-centric AI, which involved companies and citizens and research, uh, etc. cetera. Um, we here, we are in the IGF, uh, the, the governance of the deep layers of the, the real deep internet is a multi-stakeholder governance organized uh, under the auspices of the United Nations. That's very important. And if we want to protect this, if you want to continue to have a multi-stakeholder governance of uh, the broad internet, we need to define uh, some places to, to fix some issues. Uh, for example, another completely different issue is the fact that France advocate a, a fair tax system to be sure that every tech companies will pay a certain level of taxes. And we did propose this in the OECD to elaborate this principle. Each of those fora need to be multi-stakeholder, but we need to build the precise multi-stakeholderism convenient for each of these fora. So that's my first point, and I feel that it's very important. Uh, and especially because if we don't understand this, for example, some people will try to fix some issues in the deep layers. Uh, directly attacking the, 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 the internet governance itself. And we don't want this because for 50 years, 50 years, internet works. <laughs> and in fact, not so bad. So if we have to fix, I don't know, issues about disinformation, disinformation from my perspective is a direct consequences of a certain business model, the attention economy, and it's a matter of companies' regulation, not of internet uh, control. <laughs> you, you see my point? So considering this, so as I did mention, we have some, we lead some initiatives uh, like the POA, like the Paris call. I could have mentioned the Chrysler call. I feel that in the Chrysler call, about another topic, which is how to, to delay uh, terrorist content and violent extremists content uh, in respect of uh, rule of law. In the Croatian school, we did work with a lot of civil society organization, with some states, with companies, uh, with uh, Give City that was launched by Microsoft and other companies. And together, we did define uh, with something that seems to us well balanced to re remove those content uh, in respect of transparency, with some right to contest the removal, uh, with duty and responsibilities and, and prerogative of each kind of actors, companies, civil society organizations, states. And we consider that it works and it did inspire the European regulation about terrorist content and, uh, and that's great. So that's how we have to act. And I, I have my, we have our own initiatives and we will enter, for example, you are asking me about the Open Networking Group. So far, I don't know. Monday, we have the first meeting. We will go to this first meeting in a very open uh, approach. Uh, we want results. We know that we, we need to precise a bit more some norms because it remains some gray zone, for example, um, for example, France, uh, like, like, other, like all Paris Code supporters, discourage uh, hackback. We don't want the companies to, to, to make war, to enter in a warfare logic. 
But of course, we have to be very precise about what is a hackback. We also have to be very precise about uh, um, due diligences. Uh, if, I do, if we don't want a state to attack another state where is the server used for an attack, we, will, we have to be sure that the second state will make everything possible to, to, to stop the attack. And we'll, we will have to be sure about how we observe this. And we have to be so precise here because we have to respect sovereignty. We have to respect to build transparency. So we have a lot of issues to address. And um, we decide together. That's an open format. We have a great chair coming from Singapore. He will propose us something. The only thing that I can say is that as Canada and other friends, Australia, we did support a letter to the chair to, to ask to build a real uh, multi-stakeholder work. But again, the first committee, as was mentioned, is about state behavior. And everyone can understand that a part of this conversation has to be between states. <laughs> and another part has to be done with the civil society and we have to to build something very precise thank you this this was very helpful pablo do you want to add anything to this thank you Katya. um i fully agree with Henri and also with the isac from the perspective of of chile and, uh, and maybe from several states in latin america of course, I mean, uh, when it comes to this conversation at the United Nations, uh, it's very important, I mean, to um, get some concrete things, concrete steps. You know, we were talking about, for example, the, uh, the point of contact, which is uh, part of the, uh, of the, um, on the last report for the Open Ended Working Group, how useful can be, you know, for uh, um, having this um, list at the level of the United Nations. Also the survey, you know, national survey that was a proposal by Mexico and Australia, which is a very good one. It's a very good step on trying to understand about the level of implementation of norms. Uh, it's a challenge for me every time when we started, I mean, uh, a new process, United Nations, when I, I had to talk with the uh, national agencies because they're expecting, I mean, from the, uh, the outcome of these processes could be something concrete they can probably apply in their daily work so uh that's sometimes something is complicated because uh, uh for them uh, we are just spending a lot of time having discussion and dialogue and sometimes the uh, final report is not satisfied for all for everyone uh because they are you have some goals at the very beginning but then you find goals to reach consensus so Nobody's really satisfied. I have actually mixed this emotion. I mean, on on regarding the um, the final draft of the open and the working groups, and uh, it's remind me when some years ago when when Chile decides to join the Budapest Conventions, and there was a lot of discussion uh, about why uh, several states in our regions wanted to join the treaty. You know, and one of the reason was because there was a lot of uh, chances to get, get capacity buildings from, uh, you know, the Council of Europe, European Union, CPROG and Glassy projects. So uh, our agencies, they were pushing for something concrete in terms of the discussions. So uh, that is some, I, I, I would insist on the idea that, and if me and in terms of priorities for this group, at these five years, I mean, uh, in coming conversation and dialogue, we can get some things, no matter if there are a few, I mean, little thing or, or have, for example, the, the point of contact um, uh, list that will can be useful for the uh, the problem we're facing all days. And um, it's interesting what Henry is mentioned about the due diligence. We're seeing, I mean, how actually uh, uh, President Biden, you know, when I talked with President Putin about about the uh, one of the uh, uh, groups that were operating from Russian territory, say, okay, it's just something you have to do, putting down, I'm going to put it down. It was interesting in the newspaper they were referring, I mean, the agreements that were, you know, uh, achieved by international community. That was actually the, uh, what was done by the Open and the Working Group, the DGE. Um, that is something I mean, could be very practical. I mean, it's something that, of course, I mean, um, we were also seeing from in our perspective, that could be interesting in terms of how to deal with that. So 
that is something we'll let you expect more for this group to, you know, have some concrete outcomes, concrete results. Capacity building is still very important. As I said before, a strategic element uh, in terms of move on in other subjects. So um, in terms of priorities, something I would like to see and about what you're saying, the uh, I, the idea of declare the uh, cyberspace of the um, how you say Kaya, of like a free uh, or um, I mean um, uh, well it, it's remind me also discussion about other space you know I mean uh, right now is of course I mean not place and weapon there and um, but also remind me I mean of the other processes regarding emerging technologies for example the lead autonomous weapon system that we are having the discussion in Geneva has been even probably more complicated than our discussion and the cyberspace you know. And also in that photo, we're talking about the application of international law, international humanitarian law. It's a problem about emerging technologies, you know. Um, when it comes to this new technology, of course, the states one in some ways take advantage of use of them, use of them and take some benefit about it. So I think uh, this is also, I mean, why it could be a problem when it comes to trying to find a common understanding of the uh, application of international law. Um, I'm a little bit pessimistic about this possibility. I'm more optimistic that a state can move on their own national positions, but as some kind of, you know, agreement or common understanding, I think it's still very difficult because those common understanding usually they come after a major crisis. After I'm not saying cyber war or something like that, but uh, in a situation when people, real, I mean, states realize that things are maybe out of control, so we have to put some rules of the game, you know, and that way we can create some kind of um, stability at a global level. Yeah, thank you. And I, I think that to be, I think one of the points that you mentioned is really important, I think, for everybody to hear, which is the, you know, it, it's not, it's not a successful compromise if not everybody is unhappy a little bit, right? So I, I think the, the that's kind of the nature of negotiations. And, and I think we can all hope and put pressure on, on, on certain things to move. But at the end of the day, there are different people who have different opinions, different countries, different groups as well. I would also, and I think what we'll turn to Natalie next, I think the, the point that Henri mentioned around, and you as well, Pablo, about the different uh, fora and that, that they have different roles, I think it's important. They kind of reflect some of the, the questions there um, in the chat as well, which were kind of like, why are there so many different discussions? And I think it's important to remember they, they have a different purpose. Uh, you know, even if it's cyber, um, we it would be very difficult to make progress on all things cyber at the same time. So having narrower ones within the UN, like laws um, um, or the GDE, or, and, 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 and with that, and outside the UN, like the Paris call and the hack bag discussions, for example, I think, which fully agree with uh, with your points there. I think uh, it's, it's important to sort of make, make sure that we move forward uh, perhaps more slowly. I think that the, a lot of us in civil society and industry would like, but that we actually continue to move forward. And I think with that, Natalie, do you wanna talk a little bit about the uh, the high level statement on trust and security and sort of the what it is, the thinking behind it um, and, and, and what we can do to help yeah, thank you very much, uh, Kaya, for that question. Um, indeed, uh, the group of uh, co-champions for recommendation four of the report of the uh, high-level panel that we are part of, but also Microsoft is part of it, uh, other countries, um, has been looking at trust and security from a very broad perspective and to connect it with already uh, uni universally endorsed uh, objectives such as the sustainable development goals. And we also anchored it within principles agreed in the context of the World Summit on Information Society and its 10 year review, such as the importance of multi-stakeholderism and adopting a human centric approach where respect for human rights is central. Um, because in an ever more connected environment, trust and security are crucial to achieve those objectives and vice versa. 
Um, we also considered the importance of trust and security for meaningful connectivity and for vulnerable, vulnerable groups and its relation to economic and social growth. And we were conscious of not duplicating already existing mechanisms, but to look at how to reinforce and complement them. And based on those thoughts, there is now a working paper that a group of champions put together and recently discussed with the constituents of the group. And the group is uh, constituted of a wide variety of stakeholders, civil society, private sector, governments, uh, but we feel like greater consultation could enrich our thinking and vision. And the idea is therefore to publicize this uh, paper more broadly and get the views of a wider group of stakeholders. And we're looking into using platforms such as the IGF, and the regional IGF and other platforms to consult and collect views on the paper. And given the recent, uh, the recently published common agenda of the UN Secretary General that includes the proposal for a digital compact. Our work in the context of the uh, UN Secretary General's roadmap, including through the working paper, will hopefully then be an important contribution to the digital compact. Um, that having said, the common agenda is still hot off the press. So there's still a lot of thinking to be done on how to take this um, forward. So please stay tuned and let us know if you would like to be involved and or consulted to improve the working paper on trust and security. And if you would like to uh, receive a copy, I'm on LinkedIn and please uh, shoot me a message. Thank you. And I think, I think that's, that's a, it's a, it's, it's a, I would say, I mean, obviously we're involved, but it's, it's, it's a great um, opportunity for, uh, everybody to contribute thoughts and ideas and actually work together on something that is hopefully concrete that that states can then take on you know as uh Henri said a lot of these issues are have to be decided by states states are the the both the regulators and have specific responsibilities to us as citizens not just necessarily industries but if we're able to shape uh put suggestions and and sort of help input our expertise, I think that hopefully they can make better decisions. Um, but, uh, and with that, I actually wanted to touch on the uh, open-ended working group, uh, the POA, as, as well as a sort of in the role of multi-stakeholderism in, in, in these processes. I think this is a question that came, out, came up again and again uh, in, the, um, in the questions on the chat. Um, would love, you know, again, would, would love to hear and, and thank you again for supporting uh, multi-stakeholder inclusion in, in, in your efforts um, going into the, uh, the modalities discussions, but we'd love to hear what your ideas, suggestions um, on um, how multi-stakeholders could be involved in the coming open-ended working group. I know there's some chat about potentially a session uh, earlier in the week or the week before for every every time there is a formal session, there's talk of intersessionals, breakfast, but I know nothing has been confirmed, but would love to hear uh, your suggestions in terms of what would be a good way forward and also particularly what would be helpful uh, to you as state representatives um, to hear from the multi-stakeholder community. I don't care who takes it. I'm going to pick on, uh, on Isaac. Actually, I, I was trying to, to raise my hand. Uh, okay, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, well, uh, this is a this is, um, great moment to, to put this question on the table because we are uh, just uh, uh, a couple of days before uh, uh, having this substantive session of the open-ended working group. First of all, I, I would like to, to emphasize that we recently have a, 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 an open-ended working group process, uh, which uh, had some contributions coming from the, um, the multi-stakeholder community. Uh, and these contributions resulted key 
for um, uh, the developments and the, the, the language that we uh, could reach for a consensus report. So um, uh, it's not only narrative, but actually it's experience that now we have how multi-stakeholder community can contribute to advance and to support or, 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 or actually help member states to reach some, some agreements and to reach some um, uh, joint results. Um, the second element that I will say, it's basically on the experience on, on how uh, was the formula and modalities for this recent open-ended working group. From my point of view, and, and I believe that or, or at least uh, the, the, the representatives of member states that we are joining this, this conversation agree on, we do need more. I mean, it, it was good having a, a, a very first uh, step, having multi-stakeholder community in different uh, opportunities in the last open-ended working group. But I sincerely believe that we need to go beyond the previous uh, modalities. Um, but at the same time, I am also conscious about the, the, the consensus and the discussions and the negotiations at UN level. And sometimes the consensus could be very good, but other times, uh, for instance, to advance better modalities for the inclusivity uh, or, or, the, or to include more um, uh, multi-stakeholder participation, sometimes the, the consensus, it's not the best um, scenario because um, some, some other member states, some countries will prefer to keep uh, previous modalities or actually some of them stepping back uh, what we have recently. So um, be, being very conscious about this, I sincerely believe that uh, we, and, 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 and by the way, Mexico has also co-signed this letter um, uh, asking the, uh, the, the, the chair um, in a very respectful way uh, to, to address this issue and to go beyond what we recently had. Um, and taking into account, by the way, um, recent experiences at the UN level. Uh, but by saying this, I, 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 will, I will emphasize that we do need to, to push together, not only governments, but international community to have a better uh, and a more uh, comprehensive uh, participation of these stakeholders in the next, uh, in the future or the new open-ended working group. But at the same time, we do need to further advance together as community, separately, not only from the formal setting, um, to take better um, use, uh, to advance better use of the intersessional periods, uh, for, for, for instance. Um, so uh, perhaps having more, not only formal, but informal discussions, having more, uh, I, I sincerely was very surprised and on the question on the chat of how the IGF could address some of the uh, open-ended working group discussions and perhaps why not submitting something from the IGF to the open-ended working group. I mean, everything is open and we can, we can, we can try to do some of these uh, movements uh, at, the, at, the, at the formal level in the multilateral setting, taking into account, into account the, the, the simultaneous ways and the simultaneous conversation that we are having uh, at UN level. As, as, as Natalie also referred to the uh, 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 roadmap of the, uh, of the Secretary General, uh, 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 we can find something coming from that and the multi-stakeholder, um, uh, from the multi-stakeholder uh, approach to introduce in the, in the open-ended working group. Um, so uh, I have no, uh, no clear question, but I, will, I, I, I sincerely want to emphasize this. We had recent experience, and this experience allow us to say it's not narrative, but it's concretely the experience on how do the, the multi-stakeholder community contribute to, to these conversations. Uh, the second, um, taking into account that experience to try to go beyond, uh, and the third, also to be prepared all of us to make better use of not the formal, but informal and interstitial um, uh, periods and conversations. Thanks.
Thank you. This is very helpful. And I, I see there's positive response in the chat as well. I also wanted to turn, and this I am going to terribly mispronounce this, to Yik Chan, uh, hopefully, because uh, I think you have some comments. Yes, thank you. Um, just uh, to mention that uh, I'm both from the academia uh, circle, because from the Giganet, the academic network for internet governance scholar and also from the multi-stakeholder group of the API IGF and uh, also the China IGF. So I'm the MSG for both uh, regional IGF. So actually, uh, some of my colleagues actually studied uh, OEWG and the GGE. You know, many academics actually studied the process. They analyze all these documents, you know, and so my, my, I have two suggestions. The first of all is that uh, I look at all this submission, uh, the, 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 group, the NGOs or the university, they submit their proposal or recommendation to the uh, OWEG's uh, consultation process. I found that actually many of them actually is from very uh, premiers or the famous you know, international organizations such as APC or from the University of Oxford. And so I wonder, uh, is there any um, way we can improve the delivery of the message, even for the open core, you know, to somewhere which is not a permanent, like a, a south part of the uh, international uh, spheres, or even the South uh, African groups, so Asia groups, you know, less than none of them actually submit their uh, recommendation to the consultation. I was really surprised. So this is the first thing. So is there any channel we can improve, for example, either through the regional IGF, you know, and to uh, deliver the message, there's an opportunity for us to participate in that uh, debate uh, as multi-stakeholder groups, for example, through the uh, regional IGF uh, channels. And the second thing is about uh, whether we can also uh, include more academias, you know, to that discussion. Yeah, I think that's my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that was that was really helpful. And I think um, an important point to raise, I think if there's so I, I think if there is an ability to um, to bring in voices from uh, around the world, I think that would be really important, whether it's through regional IGF, regional organizations, but also um, I would probably say in particular as, as the discussions on implementations go on, um, implementation rather, I think um, through the conversations with uh, local state representatives, no, not just at the UN itself, but direct conversations with states, I think um, are the avenues to go forward. Um, and, and because we are like really quickly running out of time, I wanted to um, pose a question to all of you. Um, and, and, and having said that, I also hope that Giacomo will talk a little bit about their experience about with bringing in uh, stakeholders. And also uh, Henri will talk a little bit about what they have envisioned for, for the POA in particularly from the multi-stakeholder perspective. But the, the Uber question I wanna ask is, um, you know, if you look ahead five years um, on the other side of the open-ended working group, what are the, successes you want to see in this space for both cyber diplomacy, for norms, for international law, and just stability of cyberspace. Uh, just love to hear some positive thoughts, I think, to end. I don't know, uh, Natalie, do you want to go first this time? Sure. Um, I consider this my um, Christmas uh, wish list for, um, for cyber. Um, so let's be very um, optimistic. I really hope that um, uh, in the coming years, we will develop a greater common understanding of the normative framework with all um, UN uh, members, including on how cybersecurity and human rights are uh, complementary, mutually reinforcing and interdependent and on what applying human rights in the digital environment concretely means. Second, I hope that more countries uh, will have been able to articulate their views on how international law actually applies in cyberspace. So contributing to uh, more security and stability in cyberspace. I hope that the open-ended working group 
will have served as a useful platform for confidence building um, and uh, to nicely complement other processes within the UN and outside the UN. Um, and I really hope that the five years of the open-ended working group um, will deliver on constructive and pragmatic discussions anchored in reality based on evidence and concrete case scenarios. So we really need the multi-stakeholders for that. Um, and uh, so that we can actually agree on action-oriented solutions and proposals, how to implement the normative framework, including through the POA. Um, and I really hope that we also find new and creative way to have the multi-stakeholder community uh, more engaged with these UN processes. Uh, and finally, on a more on a broader note, I'm hoping that we will be able to finalize the WISIS plus 20 review in the spirit of consensus and we'll be able to put our differences away to preserve a human-centric approach for an open, free, secure and interoperable internet that is supported by the multi-stakeholder model. That's my Christmas list. Thank you. That is ambitious. Thank you. Jack, do you want to go next? Sure, it, it is hard to follow that, so, uh, but uh, I think from, from my, my perspective, my, my wish list would include, um, uh, uh, let's hope it doesn't take five years to see something being produced by, by the, the process, because right now with the processes being, you know, 12, 18 months length, it was always like the, the final report was kind of the, the one and only uh, measurable outcome that uh, uh, states were, were working towards. Five years is a long time if that is you know, the only end, uh, end game. So I hope that these five years will be used uh, to uh, definitely go deeper into some of the discussions, but also produce as the, uh, as the discussions proceed some, some uh, uh, additional actionable outcomes that can be then used to, to, to implement. Also because in the ICT space, five years from now, it's you know, the environment might, might change significantly. Um, I also hope that there will be uh, just a, a adding a little nuance to the point that Natalie made about the, the engagement, the multi-stakeholder engagement. I think so far, uh, you know, there is this, this uh, idea that multi-stakeholder community is often referred to as a single group, but they're not <laughs> it's not only even within industry which industry are you talking about and different types of industry could have very you know very different uh, uh propositions and contributions that they could make so hopefully i hope that in the next five years there will be an evolution of the understanding of what multi-stakeholder actually means and how different actors can contribute in different way whether they are from from industry or academia um, or civil society, it's not just one big group. Um, there are nuances there that could be that could be useful. Thank you. And that is uh, most definitely true. Um, um, Henri. Yes, in one minute. So first, uh, I hope that states will have sincerely agreed to prohibit certain behaviors, and we will work on it in the United Nations. But that's not enough. So then, I hope that we will make this while continuing to have a multi-stakeholder uh, based on human rights governance of internet itself. And, and maybe we can open this conversation with the Paris call or, or the POA. You know, digital is pretty much the only industrial sector that doesn't have safety standards. There are standards for the automotive, for space, for energy industries, but not for digital. And I hope that we will build this framework in the next five years. And this is about global security, but also this can have consequences in terms of behaviors of the states. For sure. Um, uh, Pablo? Thank you, Kadra. Um, unfortunately, um, I'm a little bit pessimistic. It's my nature. <laughs> I'm trying to be optimistic as Natalie, but, um, you know, my real 
wish list and on cyber is we can one more, I mean, into the, the future, we can actually set up the POA, which I think I put in my all hopes and dreams in this idea, which I think is really good. Uh, it fits quite well about the, uh, our needs today. And, uh, and of course, I think uh, it's a kind of irony that we are, you know, discussing about the, uh, the inclusion of multi-stakeholder in our open and the working group. I mean, the word open, I mean, looks like it's not so open. And uh, I think it's something that probably we um, should have picked in some way. But I, I would say that uh, from my perspective, I'm not so ambitious because I think that differences are huge. It's something we have to be realistic about at that point. So just maybe concrete things, little details that we can make the difference we can get from five years of discussion can make the difference maybe into the future. And definitely last but not least, and I hope a little bit more optimistic, although I definitely recognize the realism, uh, Isaac. Thank you very much, Kaya. I, 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 I'm not sure if uh, it is pessimistic or optimistic, but it is uh, indeed um, uh, that we will be here in five years, I suppose. So um, taking, taking that into account, I, uh, of course, um, uh, I, I will hope uh, to see first um, more people getting access to these platforms and technologies more experts and other countries, uh, no matter the development, no, the development uh, uh, engage, more engage in these conversations. Um, of course, more gaps bridge, but all of these in a more certain, stable, and of course, uh, secure uh, a scenario. And, and to, to reach that, I sincerely believe that if we go on the track of more implementation, more reporting of this implementation, and then more accountability and more capacity to share and more uh, cooperation uh, to offer, taking into account of all of this element, we will be able to, to reach that uh, perhaps better scenario in these uh, multilateral settings and conversations. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity for share this uh, positive uh, views. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. I know we're three minutes late, but thank you, everybody, uh, for a, in case of a lot, I feel a lot of you getting up absurdly early to join us in this conversation. Um, and also uh, for the audience, I think there was been, there's been a very lively chat discussion. Um, so hopefully we'll see a lot of you in the uh, Open Ended Working Group a multi stakeholder conversation next week as well. Um, and thanks again. Um, this was this was a fantastic insight into what is going on um, at, at the UN at the moment.